Greetings. Today is the 20th of September. This is CSC 241, Computer Architecture. We're going to extend our understanding <clears throat> that we uh, started to process about truth tables and canonicals. And one of the things that we want to be, sh be sure to emphasize is that the size of the truth table swells dramatically when the number of inputs increase. And in simple terms, because we're dealing with binary values, you take the base number two and you take the number of inputs for a logic gate or a Boolean operator and you simply use that as an exponent for the number two. So if I have three inputs here, I have two to the third power or two cubed, that's two times two times two. I must have eight rows to capture all of the possible input combinations that can be fed into a Boolean operator with three inputs or a logic gate of three inputs. And so we start working with our logic gates and as we start combining those logic gates like Legos, if we don't have a shorthand, if we don't have a shorthand method to represent the complexities of our truth tables, especially as they get larger, it gets it gets a bit unwieldy. It gets to be complicated and there's a lot of detail and it can be kind of overwhelming. The solution to this challenge, especially as we start combining all of these different logic gates, can everyone see my screen, by the way? Is everybody seeing this same screen? Yeah, yeah I'm seeing it. Okay. So, whoops, let's go back here. Uh, there we go. As I was saying, the industry uses a form of shorthand. It's called canonical expressions. When you express things in a canonical uh, manner, you're you're choosing to list. You're choosing to list the input, the original input values, the original input values before nots are applied, right? So when I say original input values, you have you have all these Boolean operators in the mix, and and you have this truth table, and you have all of these possible combinations, and let's pretend that that uh, the knot the wild card knot is in the mix it's attached to the the z input and we'll show you an example of that later in that case the knot flips the values here so instead of having 010101 down the page we have to account for that extra operator but but all of that happens after when we when we create our first view of the truth table for this scenario, if we have three inputs for a Boolean operator or a logic gate, we fill out our truth table. And then as we process what happens to those inputs, we'll get different values that populate and we'll have to put different answers, right? So this is kind of a simplified version of a truth table and you'll see how this works on a real example in a minute. The point being, we have a lot of detail. It gets very complex. If I have four inputs, that's two to the fourth. I have 16 rows. If I have five inputs, I have two to the fifth. That's 32 rows in a truth table. So I have five columns for the five inputs, and I have 32 rows. Oh, my gosh, that gets to be a very large, complex truth table. 
And it seems, again, to be a bit much. You know, how do you make sense out of this? How do you know what the end result is with your combination, your creation? The innovation that you've built when you start combining these logic gates. And so the industry says, never fear, we have a very basic way to represent the behavior of a compound logic gate or a or a complex Boolean function. The word function, when you say Boolean, it means, okay, I've got more than two or more Boolean operators in, in combination, right? So what we're dealing with here is a simple way to express what that innovation really does. And so a canonical representation expresses only the cases where the original input, the original input value, the original, the, did you notice I repeated the word original over and over again? Original, original input values, the outcome or answer is true. Now, you use the reverse canonical expression for every case where the input, the original input values result in a false or zero output, all right? So if you, if you, if you take the reverse canonical case, you would have to write out one, two, three, four, five, six expressions. If you did a straight canonical or plain canonical uh, approach to this, how many, how many output combinations would you have to capture with the canonical expressions? One, two, which would you rather do? Write out two combinations of X, Y, Z, or five, six combinations, six combinations of X, Y, Z that result in zero. Which one would you think is easiest to accomplish? Let me state the question again. If I were to capture the behavior of this particular logic gate or this particular Boolean function, and I had three inputs, and after I do all the magic, I find out that two of the answers are true, six of the answers are false, two of the answers are one, six of the answers are zero. When you do a, a regular canonical expression, you're only looking at the answers that are true. When you do a reverse canonical expression, you have to express each case where the answer that results is a zero, okay? I have six zeros and two ones. My question is, would you think it's easier and quicker to write out two cases where the inputs result in one or six cases where the outputs are zero. Should I do a regular canonical expression or the reverse? The standard canonical expression or the reverse? A standard. The standard, that's correct. It's much easier to do the standard. And all I'm doing is stating the variable label for each case, the labels for each case, and whenever I have a zero, I put a tick by it. So yesterday we talked about a case with A, B, right? But here I have a table with X, Y, and Z. I'm gonna use the standard canonical expression for this combination of functions, right? Because I only wanna represent the two and the inputs that, that give me a one output for x, what's my value? Is it one or a zero? A zero. It's a zero. 
So would I say X all by itself or would I say X tick? Would I put a tick on it? Does everybody remember the tick? What does the tick signify? What does the tick mean? We Literally use can't remember. Say again. I was saying I can't remember. The tick in the picture. The tick means that that input is zero. Mm. So if I have an A B tick, I have a one for the A. And I have a zero for the B. So let's do this for the X, Y, and Z. All right, let's walk through this. In our first case, in our first case, let's look at the teal row, the, the bluish row, okay? The X has what for a value? Zero, right? And so would I use a tick or not? All right. I, I'm not trying to trick you. I would use a tick because X is zero. What about Y? In this case where the output is a one, what's the value for the original input for Y? Is it a one or a zero? A one. A one is correct. So I'm gonna say Y. And then what about the Z? What do I have here? Is it a Z tick or a Z? It's a Z. It's a Z. If it were a zero, I'd say Z tick, but it's not a zero, so I'm going to say Z. So my first expression is X tick Y Z. Does everybody see that? That's my first part of my canonical expressions for that particular truth table. Now let's take it home. I'm going to put a, a plus sign. I'm going to use the OR operator in between because we have two cases where Either this or such and such produces a one, okay? Now, once we get started with some other examples soon, it'll be real obvious. Let's take the second case. Would anyone care to tell me what X, Y, and Z are in this expression based on the values here, here, and here? Let's take the first one. Do I have a volunteer to tell me what X is in this case? Just an X. It's just an X. Thank you very much. It's just an X. And what about the next value? It would have, it would have a tick. It would be Y tick. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and then the Z would just be by itself as well. And then the last one is just a Z. Yeah, a Z. That's it. Okay, now if I do the reverse canonical, let's just take this home, okay? Here's the standard canonical. That's this. I know if I have X, Y, and Z inputs, I know which two combinations produce a one. I can say when X is zero, Y is one, Z is one. And when X is one, Y is zero, Z is one. Either of those combinations produce a one. I go from this to a simple understanding of, okay, this is what my innovation, my creation, my ingenious combination of logic gates wields. When we were leaving the class on Monday, I said, do you remember? Well, let's just pull this back into focus again, right? I was talking about a car. Does anybody remember the car scenario I was talking about? And how you know that the seatbelt light does the seatbelt light come on when no one is sitting in the seat and the seatbelt is not connected? No. It does not. But if you put something heavy, how many of you know this? When you put something heavy in a seat, 
and it's not a person. And that heavy object really isn't something you'd put a seatbelt on. So you don't, you don't connect the seatbelt. What happens? What do you see on the dashboard? You know, see the symbol that someone said in their normal thing. Yeah, the car thinks. The car thinks somebody is sitting in that seat. So the car thinks you got somebody in the seat, but they, but what? Their seatbelt isn't connected, right? So what does what does the light do? It flashes. If you're in a certain kind of car, it's not just a light that warns you. It's something else, isn't it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. It's a beep, or it's a it's annoying, isn't it? And why did they go to the trouble to design that? And by the way, did you know that there are logic gates and little circuits, little little chips that, that tell the car how to process those combinations of ones and zeros? When you put a heavy object in a seat, it presses down on the seat and there's a metal contact in the seat. And the metal contact, when you press down on the seat, the metal contact closes. And when it closes, you have a closed electric circuit, which means a light comes on. The one results. There's electricity flowing and there's a one. Is something, is someone in the seat? True. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? I guess I should, I should be showing you a picture of car seats, right? Shouldn't I do that right now? Because this is kind of dry. I'm talking through this verbally and you're still looking at the truth table. Okay. Should should I should I pull up pictures of car seats right now? Does anyone want me to do that? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I get I get what you're saying. You get what I'm saying, right? So so uh seatbelt warning lights four See cars, uh, pictures. Well, let's just let's just search for this, and let's see if I can find images. Right? So if I put something heavy in the passenger seat. It weighs down on the seat. It presses down on the seat. There's a metal contact under the seat cushion. That contact closes. Now I have a closed circuit. There's electricity flowing from the car battery that turns on. It 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 renders a one, but it doesn't light. It doesn't light here, unless the seat belt is not connected. When you click the seat belt, you are literally connecting a circuit. The metal tab and the metal buckle closes the circuit and the electricity flows. And when the electricity flows, it renders a one. So if you have a one in the seat and you have a one on the belt, you get an outcome that says, okay, it's off. It's off. It's kind of like this. If this condition is a one and that condition is a one, then my my end result is a one. But if I if I have a one here and a zero here, that means I have something in the seat, but I don't have a seat buckle, seat belt buckle, which means I have a false. Is the seat belt fastened? False. Now I have to ring the, the bell. Okay. Now let's take the reverse canonical. The reverse canonical is a pain in the neck, but I want to walk through this because I want you to understand, okay, why do we choose? Why do we intentionally choose to do the standard canonical or the reverse canonical? So what I want you to do is to walk through this process to create the reverse canonical for this truth table, and let's do it faster, okay? So here's, does everybody understand where I'm going with this? Now I have a reverse canonical, and if I chose to do that, I could, Instead of expressing a standard canonical, I could do this. So let's take the first case. What are the values of X, Y, and Z in the first row right here? 
Are they zeros or ones? I know that's a rhetorical question, right? So what would my first expression be if I'm doing reverse canonicals? What's X, Y, and Z? Are they plain letters or ticked letters? Come on, folks. Don't tick me off. Yeah. They're all ticked, right? They're all ticked. Yes, they're all ticked because they're all zero. So, excellent. So I say X tick. Yeah. Y tick. Yeah. Z tick. Yeah. Now I'm going to give a couple of spaces here and put that, that or. What's the next case? Let's take this case. Come on, somebody, help me walk through this. It's going to be a long class if we don't. I just realized you left the computer. Um, X on Y would be ticked. X and Y are ticked. Is Z and Z is plain. Yes, thank you. So X and Y are ticked. X tick, Y tick. I'm putting a space in between each of those letters just so it's a little easier to read. Z, all by itself. Z is a one, so I don't put a tick on it. Does everybody see where I'm going with this? What's the third case? Somebody, quick. X and Z are ticked. X and Z are what? Ticked, yeah? X and Z are ticked, but Y is not. So X tick, Y, Z tick. Does everybody get what I'm going at here? Okay, next case where we're zero. Y and Z are. Okay, so this time what I want you to do is give me the whole expression. Speak truth to power. All right, so the expression would be X. Um, y tick, Z tick. X, Y tick. Take it home. What's the Z? Z tick. Z tick. X, Y tick, Z tick. Everyone, golf clap. Thank you, sir. Yay! All right. X, Y tick, Z tick. That's correct. X, Y tick, Z tick. Let's keep going. What do I got? Here's this, we got two more cases. Somebody else take it home. Speak it out. No one? I know this seems kind of tedious and pointless, but if you actually do it, you actually walk through it, you actually speak it, you're going to remember it. And then when we do things later, you'll understand how your logic gate works and other people are going to be clueless. Trust me here. This is like memorizing the multiplication tables in a binary context. Okay. I need a volunteer. Please. Who would like to speak out the reverse canonical expression for this case here, um, where the outcome is a zero. Go ahead. X, Y, Z tick. Perfect. Thank you, sir. X, Y, Z tick. And sure. my apologies if you were not doing it because you didn't want me to claim another golf clap. I won't claim more golf claps. X, Y, Z tick. Let's get that down. X, Y, Z tick. We only have one more yet. And uh, yeah, there we go. What's our last case? This one's easy. Who would like to take the easy one at the end? X, Y, Z. Go ahead. X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z. There's no ticks in that one. Whew. 
Ooh, man, which one would be easier to write out? Well, the whole point of using canonical expressions is to have what? A shorthand, an easy way to understand, an abbreviated, shorter way to understand. But in some cases, the truth table is flipped. You have very few zeros and all ones. So there are cases where it's better to use the reverse canonical because you don't have so many to do. Okay. And then there are other cases where it's easy to just go with the standard. So that's the, the part of this. Uh, I, I really wanted to make sure everybody understood in very plain terms. Uh, oh yeah, we got to update our, got to update our attendance here. Any questions about canonical versus reverse canonical expressions? All right, so you need to be able to do some things and I wanna talk you through some of the stuff that you're gonna be doing in our module. You have some assignments and solutions where you're gonna work with the logic gate drawings and you're gonna work with the HDL, okay? So let's take a look at the assignments. I'm going to have an assignment called Boolean Basics. I'll give you some simple uh, tasks to perform based on the information we've covered in the last two classes. Then I'm going to give you some functions. And you have to fill out the truth tables based on how many inputs those functions have. Then what we're going to do for our solution is you're going to use a pre-built logic gate and you will adapt the HDL code uh, in the simulator. So from our first module, you installed the HDL simulator, the build environment for logic gates, yeah? And um, let's see, there should be more detail here and posted, uh, why don't we do this? Let's do this. Oh yeah, oh yeah, here we go. Is everybody ready? Let's take this out. And let's walk back to this. I want you to be able to build a truth table and then give the canonical expressions for a function that has inputs that are labeled N and O. And here is how the Boolean function is constructed. Now, one thing you're gonna find out is that you can translate this software application function, the Boolean function, you can flip it from software side into hardware side. And here's how. Are we dealing with, what kind of operator are we dealing with here? What does that represent? And, and operator. That is the and operator, correct. So in terms of our basic shapes, which basic shape should I choose to represent the actual hardware version? Is it this one, this one, or this one? The left one, the middle one, or the right one? On the left. The one on the left. And what are the, what are the labels for the inputs? Are they A and B? Yes. Mm, let's go back to our function. Oh, oh, N and oh, O, yeah. N and O. So I could draw a round-ended logic gate that shows N and O. Oh, but there's something special about the O now. 
What does it mean when there's a line over the O? It's called O bar. What's it's going knotted. on here? Huh? It's knotted. It's <laughs> knotted. knotted. Yeah. So it's knotted. Okay. So I actually have two logic gates in this lot in the if I were to build this as hardware, I'd have an and and I'd have an N and an O, but I'd have to take the O input and I'd have to stick this in front of the O. So if the A, for our example, we don't have A and B. In our example, we have N on the top and O on the bottom. Is everybody with me? Yeah? And if I were drawing this in hardware and designing this in hardware, instead of working like as a software statement, I'd take the knot and I'd drag it over here and I'd plug it right in front, right there where the O goes in. So it's not O, not O. That's how I would draw it. Now, I don't have a stylus in front of me, but I could draw this out on paper real quick, right? I could. Um, let me see if I, let me see if I can do that, okay? I'm gonna see if I can do that. Because I want you to see how this is gonna work and how we start pulling all this together, right? This is the part that gets a little, little tricky because we're used to, Thinking in different terms. Uh, hold on. Everybody help. All right. I'm going to draw a picture. I want you to draw a picture. Based on what we've just explained, I want you, if you can grab some paper, I want you to grab some paper and see if you can draw the logic gate that that function would be like if you were to take a, a logical function in software and then flip it into hardware, because that way it's a million times more efficient. I'm drawing my picture. I want you to draw yours. I'm going to use a color, a little bit of a color thing there, so that people can see what I'm doing with that O knot. Okay. And now what I'm gonna do is turn this around and show it on the screen. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I want you to look at your diagram if you're doing this. Uh, let's stop sharing. Let's do this. Everybody with me? Yes. Now the light is kind of bad here, but I, I used blue ink. So I drew an and. I labeled the inputs N and O. The O has an extra thing in there. It's, it's shrunken in size. It's a blue triangle. Does everybody see that? Yeah. Everybody, see, everybody sees that, right? So the, the light is kind of, the light is a little, little tough to catch. The difference in color between dark blue and dark black, I'm hoping it shows on your end. Does it show on your end? Yeah, we could see it. Kind of, sort of. Okay. So I did the blue that way. That's what we're doing. Now, let's go back to this, right? I'm going to take a, how many inputs do I have? How many inputs do I have here? Uh, 
two. Yeah, two. just two. I have just two. So how many rows in my truth table am I going to have? Four. Four rows in the truth table, right. So I can actually build my truth table right now if I wanted to. I could do this. I could insert. You're not table. sharing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So can everybody see the screen? Yeah. So I go from, I'm gonna to go to my insert menu and I'm gonna do this. I wanna have a result at the end. I wanna have two columns. I wanna have four results, but I also wanna have headers. So I have a three by five table. So now what I'm gonna do is go here and I'm gonna center this and I'm gonna say N. And then I'm gonna say O. And then I'm gonna say N O O not. N O not, right? That's what I put in the last column. Everybody with me? Yeah. Now filling so. out the truth table should be easy because we've already learned that there's a pattern. So what am I gonna do in this first column? Uh, in the first column, how long you could put two zeros? Two zeros, like this, and then what? Two ones. Two ones. And then I can put here a zero, one, a zero, a one. Remember that the last column, yeah, the last column is always zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, no matter how many rows there are. The, the last column is always like that. Now, one thing I want to express to you is that we have an, an and, which means that both inputs have to be a one in order for the output to be a one. But the wild card, there's a wild card in here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this column and I'm gonna intentionally, I'm gonna intentionally do this. I'm gonna copy this in here, right? And I'm gonna make this bigger. And you're probably thinking, all right, where is he going with this? And I'm gonna make this like this. And then I'm gonna do like so, a one, a zero. I'm gonna flip each of these values. Everybody see what I'm doing here? I'm flipping the values. In the truth table, I'm flipping the values. And why am I flipping the values? Because I have a not. And that's the first order of operation. Not is the first operator that you always execute even before multiplication and division. Even before multiplication and division. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to make this a little bit more obvious on my truth table. So I'm gonna put like, I'm gonna use a lighter font so that you know when you're looking at this, it's like, okay, my initial value was this, but my final value is that. Because I want you to see the transformative effect of the not when I'm working my truth table solution. So now I'm combining a zero and one. Well, we know that it, with an and, all the inputs have to be a one or the output is a zero. So if I have a zero and a one, are both inputs one? Yes or no? No. Does everybody see how I got that result? Yeah. Okay. I have a zero and I have a zero. Now, some of you are saying, wait a minute, that other value is a one. And the original value is a one, but when I not the O, it flips into a zero. So I'm actually combining zero and zero. What's my answer here? Zero. 
oh, look, the input here and the input here have to be one and one. Both inputs have to be one in order for the and to render a one. So this is a one. What about this result? I have a one and a zero. Both and and O have to be a one in order for the output to be a one. Do I have a one for the N and a one for the O not? No. I do oh. not. So my result is this. Now, which would be easier, doing three reverse canonicals or one standard canonical to represent what this truth table does? One standard canonical. Yep. Just do the one, right? Just do this one. And the important thing to understand is I'm only capturing the original input value for the canonical, okay? Now, this is what the not did, but the not operated on the original input. So it's zero that we actually use for the canonical because that's the original value that went into O before the not was applied. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? That's the one catch about a canonical expression that always trips people up. It's like, wait a minute, why why is your canonical wrong? Because um, I did not put the original values in. N is what? It's just N. What is O? Is it plain O or O not? O tick. Is it a plain O or O tick? It's O tick. It's a plain O. It's, it's got tick. a tick. Where? So what you've just done, what you've just done is learned how an and with a single not on the second input renders zeros and ones. And the thing that I want to leave you with is there are countless scenarios like the seatbelt scenario in a car where you have to have a little bit of circuit or a little bit of chip to open the gates, close the gates, turn on the lights, turn off the lights. It's logic, right? It's the, it's the digital components that keep us safe, right? Think about this. Security cameras automatically locking doors at a certain time interval, right? If this, then open. If this, then closed. If this, true. If that, zero, right? What you're seeing is the physical representation of these logical conditions. And then if you extend that into the real world, you have a, an opportunity to automate, automate how uh, a computer can control objects. How many of you have thought of doing something to make your home a smart home? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah. Like, like, like turn on Alexa your lights stuff. with a touch of a button kind of thing? Have you ever wondered how you can turn on a light with a touch of a button? All you have to do is have a piece of software with a button that says, if true, then what? Then this output is a one. This output, it's a closed circuit. This output lets the electricity flow. That's what's going on there. That's the very thing that's going on there. Okay, we're gonna close here. I don't wanna go uh, past the top of the hour. I know we ran a little long, but I wanted to be able to connect the dots the rest of the way. What we have just done in our walkthrough is explain more about the canonical expressions, which case to choose based on the outputs that are rendered. And what we've done is taken a simple example of what happens when you take the first baby steps to combine two different Legos. Oh, I'm sorry, logic gates, right?
two different logic gates. So now, if we use this simple method for truth tables and we do some drawings and we explore how this works, we can take a Boolean function with two inputs, n and o, and render how it works, understand what it does, where n and o not do the magic. So I have an n and an o not, and they're anded together. And that's part of the chip that I'm going to build. All right, more on that later. Um, we've shared a lot. Are there any comments, any observations, any questions before we close? Um, yeah, um, for the and I'm not right. You see how you play. You see how you place the the O and then the O not within the same the same column. Is it okay that like I make a separate column and I just put the reverse of the O within that column? Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked that. The short answer is yes. So long as you do not increase the number of rows, it is perfectly fine to insert an additional column where you show the original value of the O, but then in the, in the new column, you you create what you need for the O not. What I showed you today was one approach to accounting for what happens with the, the bar, the O not. And you can use the same table, but that gets a little busy. Your instinct to add a third column is perfect. Just remember that when you add the third column, that's not the same as adding a third input for the function, right? So the truth table still has two inputs and four rows. That's the only part of that approach that can be confusing. So long as you keep it straight, that's actually a cleaner way to represent what's going on and to build the truth table. Okay? Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Beautiful insight. Glad you asked. Any other observations or questions? Okay. What we'll do now is we will stop sharing, stop recording.